All right, Bible warfare, how to defend your faith. This is lesson number seven, using pattern theology to answer questions. All right, so, so far in our class, we've uh, tried to respond to various questions that you have submitted concerning different areas of faith and Bible study and religion. And I've tried to remind you each week of the guiding principles that we have. Um, and we need to remember when having a religious discussion with someone else of another faith, or, or even you know, a person who is a Christian but has a different opinion about things, things to remember. Respect the other person's sincerity. Remember their beliefs are as important to them as your beliefs are to you. Uh, people can as zealously believe something that is false or inaccurate as they can believe something that is true. Also, uh, keep the Bible as your base. God's word is always a better response than your opinion. So remember the sentence, you know, how you respond? I believe that the Bible teaches. I believe that the Bible teaches and then go into what you believe the Bible teaches. Hopefully you, you have a, a scripture reference that you can base you know, your belief on. And number three, of course, be patient. There's a time for everything, Solomon says, even understanding and faith. Okay, so tonight we're going to continue with uh, questions, not only that you've submitted, but questions that have been submitted you know, repeatedly in the past. So in a lesson tonight, I want to tackle three questions asked by a lot of people all the time. The three are the following. Number one, why do we not use instruments in worship? This always comes back. Number two, why are there no women leading in our public worship? Why, why isn't there a woman teaching this class? Why isn't there a woman uh, uh, preaching uh, from the pulpit? Certainly women uh, are as smart as and have uh, uh, speaking skills and, and uh, can receive uh, training in the Bible just as men uh, can. Then why aren't women being used in the church to uh, fill these uh, roles. And then third question, why do we take communion every single Sunday? And not just one Sunday a month or you know, as other groups may do. So in order to answer these questions properly, we need to review some of last week's material on pattern theology. I told you that what distinguishes churches of Christ from other religious groups are two main things. First of all, um, um, what distinguishes us is what we believe about the Bible. We believe that the Bible is completely inspired by God. We hold that all of it is inspired, not just parts of it, all of it, from Genesis, the beginning of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation. We believe that it is the only inspired religious or holy book. I may not have mentioned that before. There aren't many inspired books in the world, there's only one. Now there are many religious books in the world, a lot of holy books and holy writings, but we believe that only the Bible is inspired by God. We also believe that because of these facts, the Bible is the final authority in spiritual, religious, and moral matters. Now, we believe these features are true about the Bible for several reasons. We didn't just wake up one morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to start believing that the Bible is inspired. That would be a good idea. No, there are reasons why we believe that the Bible is inspired. And I want to give you a couple of those. First of all, the Bible claims inspiration. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, every scripture is inspired by God. Every scripture, or all, some versions, all scripture is inspired by God. So throughout the Old Testament, the writers describe their writings as direct revelations from God. And in the New Testament, the writers also confirmed that what they were writing in their gospels and epistles were the very words of God. So we believe that the Bible is inspired first and foremost because that's what it says about itself. Now, there's more to it than that. There are more reasons than that, but that's the first reason. We believe that the Bible is inspired because it has survived attack. I mean, beginning with the Roman Empire, followed by the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, and then until now by many, any number of philosophers and thinkers, 
the Bible has endured and survived a non-stop attack on its credibility. And yet, while empires and religious groups and great thinkers come and go, the Bible survives intact and it grows stronger in its reach and influence you know, as, the years, as the years go by. We believe that the Bible is inspired because it is unique among books. The Bible has been studied and critiqued more than any other single written document. And the result of the examination finds that it is unique in its insight and its beauty, its unity of thought, its universal appeal. I mean, think about it for a second. In the Bible is a collection of books, right? 66 individual books written by 40 authors over a span of 1,400 years. That's what it took to put this book here together. And yet, it is head and shoulders above any other written document in every category. I mean, when you read through the Bible, it's one story, it's, it's a seamless story that, that starts from the beginning and goes all the way to the end, all interconnected. I mean, no other book has had that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of story, if you wish, that kind of um, uh, pattern. So we believe that the Bible is inspired because it's not just different, it's so different than any other book or any other a piece of writing. We believe that the Bible is inspired because it's effective. No other belief system, no other document had, had, has had such a positive impact on mankind for so long as the Bible. Some may accuse Christians of doing terrible things in the name of their religion, but when you examine their acts against the actual teachings of the Bible, you'll see that they weren't really following the Bible at all. For example, uh, you know, the, uh, if you remember the IRA, this uh, terrorist group in Ireland, and their uh, tactics of murder and, and, and destruction, and they were doing this in the name of Roman Catholicism, of their faith. But their actions were not in line with what the Bible actually taught. Romans chapter 12, for example, says that we're not to take vengeance on our enemies in the name of God. So a lot of people do things in the name of God that God doesn't sanction. A lot of people who say they are Christians are doing things, saying things you know, to defend their Christianity, but when you examine what they say and what they do in light of the scriptures, you see that the scriptures don't really support what they're saying and doing. And we also believe that the Bible is inspired because it contains fulfilled prophecy. The Bible is the only holy book that contains a record of fulfilled prophecy. A lot of holy books that say a lot of things, but only the Bible has an actual historical record of prophecies being made and then those prophecies being, uh, being accurately fulfilled. I'll give you just one example. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, Isaiah says, uh, he, Isaiah is speaking, God is speaking through Isaiah. It says, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Very interesting here. You know, the passage is referring to Cyrus, a king, who is going to uh, allow the, uh, the uh, Jewish people to return from exile, who will allow them to rebuild their city, rebuild their temple. The problem here, well not the problem, but the unique feature here, is that Isaiah, the one who wrote this prophecy, Isaiah lived 100 years before this king that he mentions was even born. How's that for prophecy? God names the king and describes what that king will do for the Jews 100 years before this king is actually born. So that's one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is inspired. There are 61 direct and fulfilled prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament that are exactly fulfilled in the New Testament. I mean, everything from the place he would be born, you know, Micah chapter 5, 2, to the way that he would die, Isaiah chapters 42 to 52, talk about 
the Messiah, when He would come, what He would suffer, how He would die, all of these things written hundreds of years before uh, they, were, uh, they took place. Only God knows the future. So when hundreds of predictions are all fulfilled, you know that God is at work here. So when we as the Church of Christ say we believe that the Bible is the only true and completely inspired word of God, we say this because we have arrived at this conclusion based on the evidence that the Bible makes this claim about itself. It survived over 2,000 years. Uh, it is special and unique in nature. Its impact on the world cannot be denied and its record of fulfilled prophecies. Only a document that has been divinely conceived and recorded can claim all of these features. I mean, there's no plausible explanation. The question is, if God didn't write this book, who did? Certainly not man. I mean, if man wrote it, how come man has not been able to write another one like it? Even today, with all the technological advances and you know, the knowledge that has been accumulated over the centuries, no one has written a book like this. No one can. Why? <laughs> because its author is divine. That's why no one has been able to, re uh, to repeat this. So as Christians, as members of the Church of Christ, we believe that the scriptures are inspired by God and they are the only scriptures that are inspired by God. Okay, so we're different from uh, other religious groups because we believe that the Bible is completely inspired and the authority in religion, in spiritual matters and morality. That's one reason we're different. Another reason we're different is the way that we apply the Bible. I said that our approach to the Bible and how we apply it to our practice of Christian living is called pattern theology. We talked about that last time. Pattern theology is the belief that the Bible contains patterns or blueprints, if you wish, that direct our actions in every area of Christian life. We believe this because when we read the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see God's people consciously using God's word in this way. Noah and Moses and Solomon and Paul and Jude all specifically taught and acted according to this principle. The principle that in the Bible there are patterns and blueprints you know, that guide us to do the things that God will have us to do. Not only in you know, how to worship Him publicly, but also, as I mentioned, how to be a good husband and a good wife and how to be a good citizen and, and how to grow spiritually and how to develop humility. You know, there are patterns and ways that the Bible teaches us these things. So these two beliefs, complete inspiration of the, and the authority of Scripture and the presence of biblical patterns to guide us are what sets us apart from other groups and, and these two principles are the basis for answering most questions about religion in the Bible. Now, now you, know where I'm, you know where I'm coming from when I answer your questions, including the questions that we're going to do tonight. Okay? So question number one, why do we not use instruments, you know, musical instruments in our worship services? This question keeps you know, popping up whenever I do one of these series. And it's usually one of the first questions people ask me, you know, if, I, if, if, if we're somewhere and you know, the, a social occasion, someone says, so what do you do? You know, I'm a minute, oh, really for who? You know, the Churches of Christ. Wait, oh, aren't you the ones that uh, you don't use instruments, right? That's usually the way <laughs> we get there. Yes, that's correct. And then many times, why is that? Well, here's the answer to that question. We don't use instruments in public worship because when we examine the inspired pattern for public worship in the Bible, and specifically what the Bible says about the use of music in public worship, we find out that the type of music used in these cases was always a cappella, meaning music without instruments, singing without instruments. When I say the inspired pattern, I mean what information and what direction does the New Testament give me in this area? 
Now there's not a lot of information about worship and music in the New Testament. It's more focused, of course, on the attitude in worship rather than the mode or the style of worship. God is more interested in the heart, okay? So there's more information on the kind of heart and attitude that we should have than the way to actually do the worship, all right? But there is some information that helps us to come to a conclusion. First of all, our worship is to follow the New Testament pattern, not the Old Testament pattern. That's one instruction we have. All right, what does Jesus say to His apostles when He gives the Great Commission? He tells them to go and make disciples of all nations, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then He says what? Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. So what are we to obey as far as our Christian life is concerned? Well, the things that Jesus has taught. So the information on worship for Christians is contained in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. Number two, the New Testament directs us to sing. There are only a few references to music in worship, but in every one of these instructions, each one of these tells us to sing without the accompaniment of an instrument. I'll give you a couple of these passages here. First one, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Paul says, what is the outcome then? By the way, he's, he, here he's talking about the public worship and how it should be conducted and the attitude uh, that people should have. Then he says, what is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Again, the verb, the Greek, a word solo, which means to sing without accompaniment um, of an instrument. Another passage of scripture, Ephesians 5, 18, 19. Now Paul is writing to a completely different group, right? A different group, and he says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so he says, be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? What does that entail, being filled with the Spirit? Well, he explains. Being, but being filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So two things there. One, he explains the nature of being filled with the Spirit. What, what is the nature of that in public worship? Well, you're speaking to one another using psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's the music. And how are we doing this? Singing, he says singing, solo, singing without the use of instruments, and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Another scripture, Colossians chapter three, another group, another group of people. He says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, again with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. The very, notice there's a pattern here, a trend, Pretty much the same instructions about you know, worship, music, pretty much the same instructions he's giving to different groups. And now we take a different author, James. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. So you have a completely different person talking to a completely different group, giving the same type of instruction. So each of these verses talks about music and worship to God, and each uses a word that literally means to sing a cappella. There are other words uh, that can be used uh, to uh, denote singing with music and instruments, but here they use a specific word which instructs a person to sing without the use of instruments. Thirdly, the New Testament never mentions instruments in accompaniment to worship. There's never a mention of that anywhere in the New Testament. Now I said a couple of, a couple of lessons back that there are 181,253 words in the King James Version of the New Testament and not a single one of these refers to instruments of music in Christian music. Okay? Not one of them refers to instruments of music in Christian music. We sing and only sing in worship because the only information in the Bible about music in worship directs us to sing without instruments when doing so in public worship. 
Now when, 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 uh, when you use the instruments, you're doing so without the support of the New Testament. I mean, a lot of churches use instruments and they use bands and they're saying you know, good things. You know, we love you, God. You know, we praise you, God. They're doing that. That's fine. But when you do that, you're doing it without the support of the New Testament because there's no pattern to it. It goes against the blueprint outlined in the New Testament for music in worship. Now, you know, having said that, of course, outside of public worship, our choice of music is guided by what, we, you know, what is moral and what is proper, what is edifying, not whether it has instruments or not. If I want to be at home, if I'm at home and I've got my guitar and I'm playing, and I'm playing Amazing Grace and singing it and saying, oh, this is a beautiful song, Lord, I love you, and you know, I'm playing Amazing Grace, you know, and I'm playing, singing and playing with, my, that's at home. The Bible is silent on what you do at home with musical instruments. See what I'm saying? It, it is specific. It instructs us as to what we ought to do when we gather together to worship. But it gives no information, well, no specific information on what we are to do with music outside of public worship. As I say, the guidance we get is, well, we should, we should flee every appearance of evil, Paul says. So that includes the type of music we listen to and, and play as well. Okay, question. Number two, question number two, why are there no women leading in worship or teaching adult Bible classes? Again, the basic answer is the same as the, as the answer to question number one. The New Testament pattern not only doesn't show or give us an example of women doing this, it actually, it actually specifically teaches against it. In other words, against women having the role of leader, elder, or teacher in the church, teacher of adults in the church. So let's, let's look at the pattern for this. First of all, there are no examples, right? No examples of this uh, taking place. In all of the New Testament, there isn't a single example of any woman leading in a Christian worship service. Not one. Women like Dorcas or Phoebe or Lydia are mentioned and they're seen as serving but not in a public worship service. There are, however, many references to men leading and teaching in worship services. In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 13, and so on and so forth. You know, all, all of the examples that we have in the New Testament when it comes to teaching or leading in the church now. Uh, always show men in those uh, positions. So there, are no, so there are no examples of this in the New Testament. In addition to this, there are, there are specific instructions as to who ought to teach and who shouldn't teach. So let's read those. 1 Corinthians 14, two passages there. In verse 34, Paul says the women, meaning he's talking again about when the church gathers together, okay? He says, the women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. And what's interesting here is he, he continues to speak on this, and then in verse 37 he says, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. Because there were some at Corinth who were saying, nah, you know, that's just Paul talking. You know, that's just Paul talking. He's just, you know, he's, he's prejudiced. He's chauvinist. <laughs> and what does Paul do? Just in case someone might be thinking this, he says, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. Now there are reasons for these instructions, but basically it seems that God has given the spiritual leadership role in the church to men and not to women. And this has been the source of contention for 2,000 years because it's not always easy for weak and sinful men to be good spiritual leaders, and it's not easy for weak and sinful women to submit to that design that God has put into place. But this order is the pattern for leadership in the church that God has set forth. Whether it is popular or easy or not easy, 
it is still the pattern that we seek to follow in organizing the church. You know, in our ministry flow charts, we show the different ministries in the church. I mean, there, there could be a hundred different ministries in the local church. You know, the helping of the, the, the poor, the uh, teaching children, uh, maintenance, bookkeeping, uh, uh, outreach, um, office work, computers, all kinds of work that takes place uh, to maintain a, a local church. And both men and women are encouraged to fulfill these roles as best they can. Here in our congregation, uh, it is a, a woman who is the uh, bookkeeper and treasurer. Uh, why? Because she has the skills and she is a faithful Christian woman and she, she does that. But she, doesn't, she does not teach adult Bible classes. Why? Because the New Testament doesn't give her that role to, to teach. And she's not considered to be a, a, an elder. Why? Because the New Testament pattern says that in the church, it's the men who are to fill the leadership positions, elder, deacon, uh, evangelist. All right? So, uh, 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 <laughs> It's not, as a matter of fact, there's a time when this idea was easier to, uh, uh, to uh, put into practice because it, it kind of matched what was taking place in society. But in our society today, where women, you know, if, a woman, if a woman is qualified uh, I, you know, and, and she's running for president and she's a, you know, a good candidate, you know, I'll vote for her to be president, that, that's fine. Women can fulfill pretty much any role that, that men have in the world, in society. But the church, you know, we, are, we have our pattern for who is to lead in the church. And whether it matches what's going on in society or not has no bearing. You know, we have to follow what the New Testament says that we should do in as much as, uh, or as far as, uh, who is to lead and who is to teach in the churches. Not a popular idea, but a biblical one. All right, question number three. Why do we take communion every Sunday? Again, the answer is that we do it this way because we have examples and instructions in the New Testament to do it this way. We know that the first day that the apostles and new disciples took it was on a Sunday because in the first century, Pentecost Sunday was celebrated on the 50th day from the first Sunday after the Passover. And the first communion taken after Jesus ascended was taken on Pentecost. Let's read that. It says, Peter said to them, we're familiar here where Peter is preaching on Pentecost Sunday. He says, repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. There's, there's the communion part. That, that's the way they you know, refer to the taking of communion. To the breaking of bread and to, uh, and to prayer. So Pentecost was on a Sunday. The apostles and disciples first began taking it on Pentecost Sunday, and afterwards we read that they continue taking communion on each Sunday. Now, for a brief period of time, while the church was in Jerusalem, there is some evidence that the church took communion whenever they gathered in addition to Sunday. But this practice was replaced by a regular Sunday observation as the church you know, spread and as it settled. In Acts chapter 20, for example, Paul says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, there's, there's that expression again, meaning taking communion, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. By now the church is well established, uh, and, 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 and the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the habits that they have, are beginning to take hold 
and we see here on the first day of the week when we were gathered uh, together to take bread. The purpose of the taking of the communion, excuse me, the, the taking of communion, he is suggesting here, was uh, done on the first day of the week. So you know, he says, we're going to be there on the first day of the week so we can take the communion. Another passage in 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which He was betrayed took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, He took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So here, it doesn't specify the day, but I'm, I, I, I'm showing this scripture to show you that this was, the, mm, this was the summary of the teaching about communion that was being taught years after Pentecost. Okay? Years after Pentecost, Paul is teaching, here's what we do, take the bread, we take the fruit of the vine, and here's why we do it. Okay? One other uh, passage here. Uh, he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also on the first day of every week. Each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. The point I'm making here, he says, on the first day of every week. So this here shows that back then, on the first day of every week, they were gathering. And when you put the, all the passages together, you see that on the first day of every week, the Christians were gathering, and on the first day of every week when they gathered, they took the communion. This is how we put together that idea. So if we take the bread and the fruit of the vine, each Sunday we are following as closely as possible the pattern established in the New Testament concerning the taking of the communion. I know some people take it once a year and because they think that'll make it really special, or they take it one, you know, the first day of each month in order to kind of regulate it. But if we study the New Testament to find out when did they do it? How did the apostles teach the early Christians? You know, what did they teach them about the communion? If you put all the passages together, you see why they took it, you know, what they took, the bread and the fruit of the vine, why they took it, and you also see when they took it on the first day of the week, and you see how, you know, how often they took it. Well, they took it every first Sunday of the week, and in order to follow the pattern, we do the same. So before I close tonight, I, I want to give you a few guidelines in using pattern theology in order to arrive at accurate and consistent conclusions in your study of the Bible. Okay. Because it's not a set thing. I mean, people follow the pattern and they study, but they don't always come to the same conclusion. That's okay. We, you know, we have to make room for different opinions. At least if we're following the pattern, we have a better chance at arriving at similar conclusions. All right, so a couple of rules here, a couple of guidelines. First of all, obedience when it speaks, discernment when it is silent. Obedience when the Bible speaks to something and it says do this, don't do that, this is how to do it, our response is, well, let's obey that, let's do that. And if, there are, if there's no information, discernment. So when the Bible explains or commands or provides an example of what it wants us to do, our response is to understand and obey. For example, we don't need 500 commands or examples to be baptized. One example and one command will do it. I mean, there are dozens of examples, but just one would be enough. God gives us enough information and confirmation of information to guide us. But when we have just one or two commands or instructions about a matter, these are more authority than 10,000 commands or instructions given by human thought. Give me one example given to me by the Lord that is more valuable to me than 10,000 examples given to me by human beings and human thought. Okay. When God gives us information in His word, then this is what we use and we eliminate everything else. On the other hand, when the Bible is silent on a particular subject, 
we can find no commands, no examples, no relevant information, then we have to use Christian discernment and judgment. For example, the Bible does not give information about birth control. Can anybody here give me the chapter and verse about birth control or the pattern about birth control or some sort of example on birth control? So we have to use discernment, we have to use Christian judgment in this matter and allow each couple to have their own opinion using the general principles in the Bible of not harming life. There's a, there's a principle we can, we can use. We, we mustn't harm life. And we must also maintain proper care of our bodies. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we must not be slothful in business, another instruction of the Bible, meaning we have to kind of manage our resources well. So those kinds of general principles help guide us when it comes to how many babies are we going to have? One, two, five, you know? In other words, when it comes to using pattern theology, we should strive to have unity in doctrinal matters tolerance in matters of opinion, and love in all else. Second principle that can be helpful in using pattern theology, know the difference between what is cultural and what is eternal. Cultural matters versus eternal matters. There's a lot of debate over issues in the Bible that stem from the fact that people fail to discern the difference between things that were cultural in nature and applicable only in the first or second century and those things which are eternal principles that remain always. You know, things like uh, the women wearing veils. Paul talks about that, about you know, should women wear veils or not wear veils to the assembly. The washing of feet meeting in homes, you know, where the church meets. There's some group that's saying, oh, it's wrong, it's unbiblical. If we meet in a building, we ought to meet, you know, because they met in homes. Well, these type of things, you know, veils, foot washing, homes, greeting with a holy kiss, you know, that's, you know, Paul says, greet each other with a holy kiss. That, that's, the, you know, that's the Orient style, the Eastern style of the time. And to this day, they continue, you know, the, you know, the, the kiss. Of course, in, in these days, the men didn't kiss the women. The men kissed the men, the women kissed the women. The men never kissed the, they didn't ever greet a woman with a kiss. But that was, that's a cultural thing. It's a cultural thing. These and other things were subject to change because they were part of the culture and habits of the first century and they were permitted by God. But the taking of communion, singing in the assembly, male spiritual leadership, among other things, these are not cultural. These were specifically commanded and given by God and they can't be changed regardless of the culture. See the difference? So when you, are, when you hear debates over various issues, ask yourself first, is it cultural? You know, the thing we're debating here, is it a cultural thing or is it a, a, a spiritual thing? And then see what are the guidelines or the pattern or the plan in the New Testament for these things. Do we have commands, specific commands or examples, or do we have guidelines, you know, principles that guide us in making our decision? It'd be nice, it'd be nice if everything was you know, cut and dry. The chapter on birth control for Christians, you know, whoop, chapter 14, or of, of, but it doesn't work like that. Sometimes we have to go through the New Testament and you know, put the scriptures together to get a, a picture, to get an idea, to get a direction. And of course, that study accompanied with fervent prayer to ask God to help us, to enlighten us, to open our minds, to be ready to receive the information that He's got for us in His work. Okay, so that's our lesson. Uh, for tonight, we're going to continue next time with more of your questions. Thank you very much.